please give a warm AmeriCorps welcome to Dr. Waller. Thanks. I was asked to talk about a number of things. Uh, so what we're gonna walk through is uh, a little potpourri of what's going on in uh, healthcare right now as it relates to mental health. And tr uh, we're gonna start with trauma um, and how the adverse childhood events really do affect uh, you know, people in our society. From that, I, I'm gonna walk into kind of an addiction neuroscience 101, as you heard from my bio. Uh, my wife just uh, collectively calls me a nerd and just leaves it at that. So we're gonna dig through that. And then after that, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what the system should look like for this. We're gonna talk about marijuana and poly substance abuse. And, uh, and then by the end, we'll be able to ask some questions. So if you have a question, think about it, write it down. We're gonna hold those to the end so that we, uh, because we're filming and as we uh, pull that stuff together, we wanna make sure that there's a clear connection of information from start to finish. But ask whatever you want, because at the end, we're gonna play stump the chump and it's your job to try to make me uh, uh, answer, I don't know, that's really tough because I am still a nerd and I work really hard at that. So has everybody heard of uh, adverse childhood events? I mean, you guys are working in this space right now. That is when something bad happens to someone at a young age and that bad something could be uh, physical trauma, it could be emotional trauma, it could be neglect, which is one of the worst ones. And, uh, and, and as we look at this, that can happen to an individual or it can actually happen to a group of individuals at the same time. So we see trauma as things like poverty by itself is its own version of trauma. And when we look at it, the question is, well, what does that mean? Because we hear all of these statistics that talk about, you know, trauma is something that causes people to have an increase in a number of different diseases or a decrease in the ability to interact with other people or an increased risk of addiction. So why is that? Like, what's the how does that happen? Just because if somebody yelled at you, did you automatically now have a worse outcome? And why do some people who get yelled at not have this bad outcome? So let's talk a little bit at first about resilience, and then I'll get into what happens to those that are not necessarily in that position of resilience. So resilience is where someone depicts themselves not as a victim, but actually depicts themselves as a, a savior. So the savior could be, I'm the elder, uh, sibling in a family, and the uh, drunk parent comes home and wants to inflict damage on the other ones, and you basically take it. You take it for your other siblings, you take the beatings, you take the yelling, you take all of the negative stuff so that you're protecting uh, your other siblings or protecting your mom. This, uh, this role, this thought process actually changes the way that the brain prepares to interact for that, and because of that, we find that people who take on that vision early do okay, even in these settings. And what we find the reason is, is because they've never given up emotional control and had that taken away from them because they felt like they were in control of what was happening because they had chosen to take it. So because they had chosen to take it, the brain flips into a different couple of places that we don't normally use. We find this in resilient warfighters, people who go into uh, the military and can go out and do crazy stuff and come back and be like, hey, I'm just gonna grab a burger and we're gonna, I'm gonna go hang out, as compared to the people who come back with a lot of emotional baggage and PTSD and all of these things. So there are people that have resilience and resilience is very much based off feeling like you are in control of what is happening to you and why. And so as you start to see people um, that do well and they're like, well, I did fine. I don't know why these other people did remind them that everybody has a different path to the world in which they live, right? And we can't ever live in the square foot of land that somebody inhabits. We have to recognize that each person has the way in which they got there. And trauma is very individualized in that way. If somebody's at home and parent comes home every evening after work, generally angry, it's gonna yell, sometimes hit, and you're a kid at that house, you're gonna hear uh, the door open and that yelling occur. You're going to try to keep yourself from being a part of that, so you're gonna find out what they're angry about. I told you to clean your room and do the dishes and do these things, so then you're gonna learn, well, if I clean my room and I do these dishes, then maybe I'm not gonna get yelled at. So you learn to prep for that. And maybe when you hear the car coming down the street, you, uh, you, you're like, oh, okay, I gotta do this, and I gotta get it done quickly, and you, you raise your anxiety level up, but that anxiety at that point is protective, right? Because you've identified 
that if I do these things, I'm less likely to have that negative interaction. And when you're less likely to have that negative interaction, you're less likely to feel bad about that interaction or take that physical or emotional beating uh, that you're taking. But then it gets to the point where any sound that sounds like a car stirs you up a little bit and you get anxious. So that thing that became protective, especially once you leave that environment, now becomes pathology. Because as you've done this over years in this household, you've started to identify what am I thinking about and what am I doing? And, and how am I gonna keep myself from getting hurt or my brothers and sisters and that from getting it? And while anxiety in that setting can be protective, and sometimes physical violence can be protective, right? Because as you get a little older as a, as a boy or even in you know, many households, the females where somebody comes home and is going to inflict physical harm, you fight back. So you find that that fighting back was protective. Whatever the thing was that helped you to move through that trauma or was the way that you could decrease that trauma becomes your default behavior. So the default behavior is you hear the car coming home, you immediately clean everything up, and you go to your room and you hide and you isolate. You do that all the way through middle school and all the way through high school, then you leave that uh, household. Now anytime you hear a car, you panic and have basically the equivalent of PTSD. But at the time in which you were in your household, that was protective. So that behavior at that point was what you need to, to get through that. You found value in that behavior. So we know about value and we know about default behaviors because we actually know the parts of the brain that these occur in. And these parts of the brain are really important because they also are parts of the brain that are affected in addiction. And they're more likely to be affected by addiction if you've had early life trauma. So one of these parts of the brain is called the orbitofrontal cortex. So this part of the brain is responsible for value. It's how I um, attached value to the large plate of Krispy Kreme donuts that was in this room when I walked in. And I was like, all right, that's pretty valuable to me at this point. And there's a possibility I could get some of those in my rental car out in the, uh, the parking lot and they'll be super warm when I leave here and then I can eat five more quietly behind the, the steering wheel and nobody will see that, so, right? So that's, that's attaching value. And then we also have the default behavior. The default behavior is if you have stimulus A, you do B. Stimulus A, you do B. There's not like a big logical thought process that goes around with this, right? You're not doing a pros and cons sheet on a refrigerator of every behavior that you have. We have default behaviors. And those default behaviors in value become really instructional as to how we see the world and how we react to the world around us. So if you've had significant early violent interaction, your default behavior is going to be to hide. And then your body finds value in isolation. And once you identify value in isolation, you'll find that later through life, this is a, a person who isolates. And their default behavior in any fight is to become introspective and move away. And so instead of being outward and dealing with conflict, they hold all that conflict in and then they go hide. Not just figuratively, but really. This also happens in a violent household where somebody feels like they need to fight back because you find um, your, the value in fighting back because it keeps you or your siblings from getting hurt, but then you find your default behavior to conflict is violence. And so it seemed okay then, but we have rewired the brain through all of these traumatic events to be able to defend ourselves at that moment, but the minute you leave that situation, it's pathology. And in some of those instances, it equals domestic violence both the creator and receiver of that domestic violence because the, the default behavior may be just to be submissive and take that behavior because you knew it wouldn't last as long. Because you knew that if you, if you fought back or you yelled back or you did those things that it, um, that it was just gonna prolong that agony. And so you found value in submission. And then you have someone else who had found value in that, you know, th that outward aggression because that's what actually had saved them and it becomes their default. Interestingly, we find that those two groups of people come together often. And the reason being is because that was the area in which they had been built for over time. They had trained their brain and their brain had ultimately laid down new neuronal tracks to feel comfortable in that violence because it was trying to protect them. It was trying to say, how do I take this environment and make my brain and make my body fit the environment in which I'm in? It's no different than the changes that the body makes 
as we try to you know, move into an environment that has famine. So if you have an environment that has famine, your DNA will change while you're in that famine state. The DNA stays the same, but how your body uses it changes. It's called epigenetics. And so this helps you to change the way you think about food, look at food, metabolize food. And we used to think that it only happened to that individual. But what we've identified through current research is that epigenetics can actually be inherited. And if you look at things like famine, that's pretty protective, right? That's pretty cool. The, the, the baby comes out kind of ready to not get fed. And so they're gonna, their metabolism, their thyroid, their hormones, all of those things will be geared to work in a low calorie environment. The problem with this is, is that if this individual has been in an adverse childhood event or chronic poverty or chronic violence or chronic neglect, they have made their brain um, set up so that they can handle it, but their DNA has also changed the way in which it's used so that it can optimize for that situation. When we remove them from that, it doesn't necessarily go all the way back. And it can be transferred from generation to generation. So the question is, is well, how many generations does this happen? Well, the good data shows right now it's about seven generations before it fully clears. And this is really scary, right? And we wonder, well, why can't we fix this problem? I had this argument with a family member of mine recently about, well, we, we've been talking about this for three generations. Why can't they get better? And I'm like, well, actually, it's going to take about seven, and we still haven't even done any of the basics to set up that seven to start now. So three generations ago, we still had schools that were um, delineated by color. Three generations ago, we still had people who had, didn't have a right to vote. We had people who didn't have the right to have any kind of leadership in society, and somehow you expect that to just flip a switch because you've started to move towards some of those things happening. And so we haven't even gotten to the point where we can move forward from that. Addiction is no different, and as we dig into the neuroscience, I think you have to understand the trauma because people who live in a traumatic environment are set up to find something to make them not have to feel that anger, that anxiety, that frustration, that fear that comes from that trauma. The first time that you have a drink, the first time that you smoke a cigarette, the first time that you take a pill, it immediately turns that off. And then the brain clicks as that is really valuable to me. It is really valuable that I'm no longer suffering because I have taken a pill or I had a drink or I did whatever. Somebody, maybe it was a prescribed benzodiazepine like alprazolam or Xanax. And you take that first one because you're so anxious you can't do it and you're like, this is what normal feels like. So this is the problem that we have, is if we have this adverse childhood event set up, even if we've had someone who's a full generation out of that, and we're like, How, why aren't you behaving like this? You're not there anymore. Remember, they've laid down the neurological tracks. When I say that, laid down the tracks, it's literally like you've built a train track. You've taken hard steel and you've hammered it in, and that's the direction it's going. Because in order for us to learn anything new, to do anything new, to have muscle memory, whether it's a golf swing or neuroscience, you have to learn it through repetition in the building of memory and the building of tracks that allow us to have a rapid access to that memory. So if we think about that again on the default behavior, that default behavior over time, once you find that correct default behavior, that means you're more likely to do it over and over again because it's the thing that keeps you out of that to where it becomes unconscious. It becomes the behavior that occurs without thought. It becomes a reflex. And so when people reflexively retract from an argument or when people reflexively lash out at an argument with no buffer in between, there was no thought that occurred for that. We want to ascribe intent in those situations to people who make us feel uncomfortable. But at the same time, there was rarely ever an inclination of intent. What it was, was the learned default behavior associated with the value of safety at some point in their life that we're seeing. I saw this on an airplane. I guess it was now, I fly a, a lot, but uh, there was somebody who obviously had never flown. They were late for their flight. We landed, we're still taxiing on the runway. They get out of their seat. They start to pull their bag down while we're still rolling. And, and you see how people react in these uncomfortable situations. And I love these situations as long as they're not dangerous. This one almost became dangerous. But 
you're sitting there and you look at what people do. So this person obviously had never flown. They don't understand that federal aviation rules state that you stay in your seats until you hit the, the thing. So they, they, they do that. Then a couple of people, in a not nice way, lash out at this person. And, and they, they're like, you're breaking the law. This is like a felony. Like there's somehow the, the airplane cop all of a sudden, right? Like they've read the federal statute that specifically tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. And you're putting us all in danger. And I'm like, well, it's a little heavy handed, you know, for that. And, but then this person reacts by kind of just head down, focused, finishing what they're doing, not listening because they're catching it from all angles. And so I could see what that, that was the protective reality uh, that they had yelling, screaming, and, and all of that. And then, then there's another couple, of, then he finally you know, gets up front to, to the front of the plane and they talk to him and he goes back to the seat until we park, but then gets up quickly to try to jump in the front of the line. And for those of you who travel all the time, everybody's always late for their next flight. So everybody always needs to get off because it's, it's now boarding and we all know that. Like I landed yesterday and, uh, and I, my plane had been boarding for 10 minutes, but I knew it was gonna take me 17 minutes to get from this gate to that. And that's when you fly too much. But the, and you, you do the math and you just relax and you go there. And if you get there, you get there. And if you don't, you don't. It's just a reality. But everybody was up. And now all of a sudden we had a couple of others chiming in because he had cut that. And they're just digging in and digging in and lashing out. And, and then I say, everybody just needs to de-escalate. This is ridiculous. You know, calm down. And then the guy who was in the front of the seat with me turns around and drops an F-bomb for pushing against me. Now, does it change the story if I say the person who got up out of their seat out of turn was black and the rest of the people who were yelling at this person was white? Yeah, it should. If you say it doesn't, you're just wrong. So I'm just letting you know. <laughs> this dynamic happened very rapidly and it de-escalated very rapidly. And at the end, I got yelled at because I was perceived to take the side of someone else. And it was really interesting to watch this and watch it de-escalate very rapidly and how you would see three other people of color get very tense in that moment. And it almost turned really ugly. Now, I'm telling this story as someone who is a white male doctor, right? I come from a space of power in a sense that I didn't even earn this. I just walk into a room. They don't know I'm a doctor. They don't know I have a bunch of degrees. They don't know I'm a nerd. They don't know what I do. And I walk in, and I can be like, I want this. And they're like, OK. It's a weird space to inhabit. But unfortunately, that's the reality and the power dynamic that has occurred over time. And that by itself is trauma. Just by inflicting someone, someone's power on someone else, whether you wanted to or not, creates a power dynamic that over time creates a large group effect of trauma. And so as we start to think about how do we move past trauma, we have to think about just inhabiting a certain space, and whether that's being an American Indian, whether that's being Latino, whether that's being African American, inhabiting a space in which that's not where you are creates its own dynamic of having less power. And we talked about the difference between resilience and creating a traumatic interaction and environment and how that space has to do with you had the power over your decision versus not. So just having that innate power dynamic in some neighborhoods, and this is after spending two years doing um, street medicine in Camden, uh, New Jersey, uh, where I learned a lot <laughs> from the people that live there and listening to that, just having that power dynamic in every location that you go can be trauma. So when I start to talk about it, I gave you a very obvious example, right? An obvious example of somebody who comes home and has physical trauma, somebody who comes home and gets yelled at. And you know things like sexual trauma and, and neglect, all of those have a default behavior that people try to survive in. But when we look at it, we have to think not only the individual trauma that occurs, but cultural trauma that occurs on a pretty regular basis. And as we think about what that means for risk in certain places, we always have to keep that in mind. So how does this relate to addiction? Because we talked a little bit about if you have this horrible you know, trauma and you, you didn't have resilience because you didn't make that, or we didn't do what we should do, which is basically put resilience training in pre-K all the way through you know, high school and start it from the beginning and build that into the infrastructure of every educational system, um, as well as like mindfulness. And there, there's a whole bunch of stuff we should do before math, to be honest. <laughs> But at the same time, when we start to look at what we're given and what's currently happening is we have a subset of the population that either lives in poverty, has a, a hierarchical power differential secondary to their culture, or ultimately has direct trauma 
on them. And that portion of the population is about 40% of the US that, that fits one of those categories. So close to half of the people have that. And I would say close to half of the people in this room have had that. And so one way or another, and if, and if you separate it out by types of trauma, you could start to pick how that would happen. So uh, the data shows that at minimum, 30% of the females in this room have been a victim of some version of a sexual assault. Just what the data shows. It's a horrible thing. I mean, when you start really digging into what that is and then you recognize what that does to a society as a whole over time, and as we start to evaluate that, this becomes really important as we talk about what trauma is and what it does to the brain and default behavior and value allocation and all of those pieces because if this many people in just this room, not let alone the room of the world outside of here, we all bring that to the table. We bring that with us when we talk to a person, when we talk to a family, when we ascribe intent, and when we do these things. You know, I, the more that I've lived in the world and spent time digging into the world around me and not isolating from it, I've identified that um, most people are frustrated with things. Very few people are like, this is awesome. Most people are frustrated, Most, some people have depression, anxiety, a combination of those two. Some people cope with uh, uh, behavior, some people cope with uh, drugs and alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, whatever it is. And so realizing that in this room, there's a subset of the group in here that cope in the way that they cope. And that is always brought to the table when you're doing your work in the field. So you have to be introspective about that. And if you think about your own pathway to trauma, and let's say you were the resilient one, Let's say you were the one who actually made it through, and you're the successful one in the family because of that. Let's say you're the one who you know, fought back on that you know, angry parent or angry foster care parent or uncle or whatever that may be. When that happens, that's the role that you've chosen to take on in life. And as you started to do that, you maintain that resilience, which allows you to push through in a lot of places. But if we ascribe that same kind of thought process and intent to someone who never did have that resilience capacity, then we overlook how we're supposed to be connecting with them because we think they should be doing what I'm telling them to do and how I'm thinking. And this becomes really problematic with how we start to interact with people if we want to make society better. Because the first thing that you have to do is you want to improve society overall is recognize people are their own selves. They inhabit their own square foot of land. They do the things they do because of their history, their genetics, and their epigenetics. And as those things come to light, the best we can do is facilitate information to them and give them choices of ways that they want to apply that truth, that science truth that we want to give them so that they can improve their lives and their outcomes and be less likely to create that kind of pain and suffering to their own next generation. That's the role when it comes to trauma that our job is. So with addiction, it piggybacks on this. And if we think about it as uh, a hierarchy of events or a landslide or a waterfall effect, we all get our genetics. We don't have any say about that, right? You don't get to put in your orders, right? Everybody just gets what they get. And then from that, you get your epigenetics which again, we don't get to say which ones of those epigenetics we want. We, don't, we get the history of our parents and their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents, not because of the, the specific genetic code, but mainly because of the epigenetics that have followed down through there. The traumatic environments, the war, the strife, the poverty, the immigration pathways, all of those things lay upon you no matter who you are and where you're gonna be. And so as we look at at a piece of this, we have to understand that if you have genetics that set you up, it sets you up, right? It's a reality. Followed by trauma on top of that, that flips a switch. Because any resilience capacity that you had left is now gone once we flip the switch, especially if you're at genetic or epigenetic risk. And when it flips that switch, you've lost the ability to have, you know, a feeling of safety around you, a feeling of safety even when you're alone and in a place. And if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the very bottom, before you can do anything else, you have to have safety. And if you don't feel safe, 
you really are not going to be very good at creating relationships. You're not going to be good at interacting with other people and creating good attachment with that because you're not going to trust them. You're not going to have the trust required to have an authentic healing relationship with someone. So you're generally not going to be able to give them any hope or solace or happiness, and they're not going to be able to give you any. You may chit-chat, and you may text, and they're Facebook friends, and look at all the friends I have and the pictures I do. Those are all fine, but it's not the same as attachment. And so if we've set this up, there are four things that I call the sentinel syndromes that occur at a higher rate in that subset of the population. And one would be addiction, other is severe mental health disorders, and the other is poorly treated chronic pain, and then the other one is cognitive disorders. So cognitive disorders occur, uh, traumatic brain injury, those that were already kind of on the IQ scale on the lower piece, so it's harder for them to take information on or had a significant learning disability that wasn't identified, it's now amplified because they, they weren't able to achieve and they've added on the emotional contextual piece of that. And then after that, they're more likely to have transportation problems, more likely to have criminal involvement, more likely to have telecommunication problems, so you can't get a hold of them and they can't show up to an appointment or they maybe have a felony. And then they're more likely to have a whole bunch of chronic diseases. But what we've done for the last 50 years is focus on the bottom of the waterfall. We focused on all the chronic diseases, right? We focused on, we have a diabetes program or a COPD program or an asthma program. But interestingly, the work you guys do goes all the way to the top of this ladder. It goes all the way to the top of the waterfall and it works where we start trauma. And if it really, if you want to prevent that whole waterfall of stuff that occurs, you have to prevent the trauma. And you prevent the trauma through support and you, you, you know, decreasing uh, you know, lack of connection. And there, the, the old you know, psychological experiments where they talked about the wire monkey mommy and the carpet monkey mommy, where they took little monkeys and they put them on a wire monkey with a carpet on it. And they were able to make friendships and actually have fun in their cages, whereas the one that just had a wireframe mommy, uh, they couldn't because they never had that early. So that attachment that's required early in life is there for a purpose because if you don't learn how to attach early, quite honestly, you don't ever learn how to attach. You assimilate the behaviors that other people think you, that you think they need to see, but the, the ability to attach and have that be seen as valuable Remember, that sits in, in the part of the brain where value sits, right? It sits in that, you know, you know and so when we, when we build in that, the default behavior may not be toward the value of connectedness. The default behavior may be toward isolation or violence or all of those. So that attachment piece that comes in becomes problematic. So addiction, that first one down, now that we know all there is to know about adverse childhood events and you know, how you have a default behavior, you create a new value matrix, and how that works. Let's talk about addiction. So you need three things to survive, right? You need food, you need water, you need dopamine. So dopamine is this chemical in the brain that got you out of bed this morning, right? It's a thing that you got up and you got to the coffee machine and you drank your caffeine and it brought you in and you made it, right? That it, we know so much about dopamine and motivation and reward that we even know levels of these things. So if I talk specifically about this and I talk about, um, you know, this dopamine level, anytime that I say dopamine, I want you to think motivation. Anytime I use the word motivation, think dopamine because they are inseparable. You cannot have motivation without a bump in dopamine and you cannot have dopamine without some version of a new motivation. They, are, they happen together. So your, your regular day, wake up, you get coffee, you drag yourself in to get, to get here, and you're like, this is great. This is going to be this dude for two hours. And then you get there. That requires dopamine. It requires motivation to be able to focus for that. And then with that, we've done experiments now where we know how much dopamine that takes. It's about 50 nanograms per deciliter, right? Five zero. So 50 nanograms per deciliter is the amount of dopamine that we have to make in the reward part of our brain to motivate to get out of bed and just show up and be okay about it. And specifically, this area of the brain is called the nucleus accumbens. And I'm using these parts of the brain, not because I want everybody to be neuroscientists, but because my patients know these things after they've been in my clinic for a while. They know what parts of the brain we're working on, just like if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you tell people what bone you're operating on. 
People need to understand that when they say, so you're saying it's in my head? I'm like, well, yeah, but specifically, it's in your orbital frontal cortex, or it's sitting on uh, your lateral habinula, or it's in your nucleus accumbens. And so they'll come in and be like, doc, my nucleus accumbens is wrecked. And, and they'll literally say that, and it's funny to me, but it's also something we can focus on and work through because I know what that means. I know that they have a low dopamine state, so they have very little motivation right now to do things. But we know enough about that part of the brain that we can monitor it from a functional MRI, so a picture of the brain that tells us what function is happening there. And when this occurs, we know kind of what the bad day is, right? The day you get on the phone, you, you, you like fake vomit on the phone, you call in sick to work, you're like, can't make it, uh, you know, you, you, whatever it is that you do on the day that you just can't go in, right? Like I sit in my basement and play Xbox and, um, and eat plates of Krispy Kreme. I mean, that's like, that's a game on low dopamine day for me. And then some people don't, they just isolate, they go read a book, they hang out, they take a hot bath, whatever. But we know that that's about 40 nanograms per deciliter, right? So 50 is what we need to kind of have a normal day and move forward, and we know that low dopamine state, that lack of motivation is about 40. So what about the best day ever, right? Best day ever, you won the lottery, you won an island, you instantaneously have 2% body fat, like all of that, like boom, that hits all at once. That's about 100 nanograms per deciliter. So this is the range we're supposed to live in. Our favorite food, is about 94 nanograms per deciliter. Sex, it's about 92, so bummer, but <laughs> it is what it is. You probably need to redo that research, but it's just where we are. And, and so as we look at it, this is where we're supposed to live as humans, right? We always have the people that live at the bottom, like you know, the Eeyores are like, oh my God. <sighs> I know it's like Friday and it's sunny, but then there's Monday in a couple of days. It's like they can only, it's like really not motivated. And then we have those that live at like 70. They're like, oh my God, it's Monday. This is the best day ever. This is going to be so awesome. And I'm like, I want to throat punch those people every time I see them. <laughs> but we live somewhere in there, right? And depending on what we're doing and who we're with and how we're focused really depends a lot on where we live within that scale on a regular basis. This is really important because the fundamental way in which we get a reward to create a connection, a reward to do work, a reward to be with our kids. I mean, I saw my seven-year-old catch a fish. We were down at the Gulf Coast in Texas, and, um, and he caught a fish in the ocean. It was just a little bitty, a little bitty croaker fish like this big. And I've never seen him that happy. I mean, just like beaming, the happiest, like, dude, this is boss, it's, it's awesome, you know, it's, it's just like, you know, every YouTube euphemism that you could think of, he was spitting off in a second. He was so happy. I mean, that is dopamine, that is the thing, that's the quintessential part of being, because what it did is it motivated him to stand there on the pier for four more hours and catch nothing, <laughs> until he was finally just hungry enough to go back. And he's like, Dad, can you fix my fish? And I was like, okay, this will be a little, little treat. It'll be great. But he was happy for that. Like, those are, that's life. So you mess with that system and it messes with that normal mechanism that we require to motivate to do good things, to have delayed gratification, because we know that the little dopamine now is going to be worth the big dopamine payoff later. And if we mess with that, then we're in trouble. Well, this is exactly what happens with addiction. So best day ever is 100 nanograms per deciliter, right? But what about if I take methamphetamine? Well, that's about 1,100 nanograms per deciliter. So it cranks that dopamine up by 10 times the amount. And when that occurs, the brain doesn't like it. Immediately, it doesn't like it. And in fact, the brain will never, ever produce that much dopamine again. It has turned off the spigot for that high of a dopamine again. My patients with addiction will call that chasing the dragon. They'll say, I can never get that same feeling again. And my answer is, nope, you can't. Because the brain has already tried to undo that. You'll never get it again. 15 years without use and you use, still not going to do it. It learned. It figured that out and immediately flipped that switch. But if you continue to use, the brain doesn't like to be told what to do. It likes to create what we call homeostasis, meaning it likes to stay where it's supposed to stay. The same endocrine levels, the same dopamine levels, the same you know, serotonin levels, all of those things are meant to stay kind of in this. So you have a sad day and a happy day, sad day, happy day. It's meant to be, be in that so that you can have appropriate emotions for appropriate reasons. The problem is, is that 
the brain now thinks that it's making too much dopamine and it doesn't need to make any more because it's getting this outside effect. So instead of 1,100, it's 900, then it's 500, then it's 300, then it's 200, then it's 100 when you use uh, methamphetamine, then it's 50 when you use. This is a real problem, especially since methamphetamine does it the most, but heroin's right behind it. Alcohol's right behind it. Marijuana's right behind it. Nicotine is right behind it. Gambling is right behind it. And what it does to the brain and people that are, more, that are susceptible to that. Now, everyone will get a bump of dopamine with methamphetamine. Not everyone will get a bump of dopamine with alcohol. Not everyone will get a bump of dopamine with nicotine. There are certain people that have an adverse reaction to certain things and are like, eh, I'm, I'm okay. But for those that are more susceptible to this, they will have a profound moment when they use that substance that they will never forget. They could paint you a picture of exactly what was happening at that moment. The clouds in the sky, the temperature of the day, the smells around them, the people they were with, they will be able to do that because we have now laid down such a strong emotional memory in the brain that it will be there forever. We all have a few of those, right? We all have those memories that we associate with positive or negative emotions. At their extremes ne in a negative emotion, it's PTSD, right? Where you smell something or hear something or think something and it sets off this cascade of emotions um, and anxiety that goes to the fear center and the amygdala. And when that happens, uh, we don't feel like we're in control. Well, it's the same thing for the happy feeling. Just thinking about using that drug again bumps dopamine. And in fact, it bumps dopamine many times to about 70% of what the drug would because of the anticipation of using the drug, which then reinforces the thought process of having thoughts about the drug, which then turns into craving over time. So when we look at a person who has addiction, we have to take into account where did it start? Because most people made the same decision a lot of us made in our lives. At some point, we decided to have a drink. At some point, we smoked a cigarette. At some point, we took a benzodiazepine. At some point, we smoked a J, whatever. I mean, whatever that one point was, that was the only time in which it was truly a decision in the way that we think it's a decision, where it's kind of a logical thought process. The brain hasn't been warped by the substance at this point. But then you take that, you get this rapid bump of dopamine, that thought process continues, which makes it a little less like a decision, then a little less like a decision, and then a little less to the point of which it becomes the default behavior. And so as we look at this, the value assignment that drugs give someone is directly responsible to the void that they're trying to fill with that. So when we have people who start early in their lives because of all of this adverse childhood events, that will become the thing in their mind that is the most valuable thing to them. It is more valuable than school. It is more valuable than money. It is more valuable than friendships. It is more valuable than their children. It takes over that part of the brain. And then because it's the most valuable thing, what we do is we create a default behavior to identify and obtain that substance. Just like we would create that default behavior to obtain that safety and whether that was an over-connection to someone or a distancing and isolation from someone, this takes that over. So not only do we have this disproportionate release in the reward system that creates this maladaptive thought process, it then over time locks it in as the default behavior. So this is a problem because it's not just, well, you should, you should just put that down. You know, my uncle stopped on Tuesday and he's fine. You just stopped cold turkey. I don't know why you're making a big deal out of it. Well, there's a portion of people who haven't locked that into the value system and haven't locked that into the default behavior, and so they can just turn it off and walk away. They can do that. They haven't had their dopamine suppressed to the point of not having the capacity to be happy or connected or motivated. So someone who's used a substance over and over and over again, remember we started at 1,000 and we went down? Well. Let's say we did the right thing. We identified that they have a substance use disorder. We identified this person. We get them, we detox them, we get all this drug out of their system. Well, dopamine doesn't just bounce right back. Now what we have is somebody who their best day is 35 nanograms per deciliter, and their normal day is 15. So it's like Eeyore with a tranquilizer dart, right? They don't get out of bed. They don't motivate to go to an appointment. 
They say, get out of bed, because we dragged them out of bed, they just wear their pajamas. They don't feel like they have to be in front of anybody or make a positive impression or do these things because they don't have the innate ability to motivate. And when I say that, it's not motivate. That's just like yelling at them, make dopamine. It doesn't happen. It's like yelling at a diabetic to make insulin. As loud as you can yell, they're not going to make any more insulin. And it's the same thing with dopamine. This is a process that has happened over time, and we're having to deal with the aftermath of this. The crux of addiction really centers around the behaviors associated with it. It has less to do with the actual use of a substance in one way or the other. So if I have a patient who comes to my emergency department, and in their urine I find that they have cocaine and heroin and benzodiazepines and alcohol, that's not a diagnosis of addiction. A diagnosis of addiction is not the presence or absence of a drug. It is the way in which they choose to use a drug, the, the way in which the, they have the lack of control of use of that drug, choosing the drug over things that are more important like safety or family or health or work. Those behaviors are what we define addiction as, not the presence or absence of a drug. So if we define it based on behavior, and in fact, we know these behaviors so well, we've been able to narrow it down to nine behaviors. And that's how we diagnose it through the diagnostic and statistic manual that we use for psychiatry. And we define an addiction as the um, inappropriate utilization of a substance in a way that becomes pathological and uncontrollable. And so when we see that, they're creating harm based on continually using the drug. And that harm can be emotional, it can be monetary, it can be uh, physical, it can be you know, legally, all of those things are where the drug gets there. But that's, again, assigning the value of the drug over not having a felony, over having a family, over having you know, a relationship with your kids, over having a job, all of these things um, the drug takes the place of. But to demonstrate how hard it is for somebody to turn that off once that's started, let's talk a little bit more about craving. So we've done these studies, and when I say we, it's the collective we, like the large PhD nerdy we around the, the country. And um, when you consolidate all of these studies and you look at what we've looked at, we've looked at what does a person's craving look like? And we know what part of the brain that's in as well, anterior lateral prefrontal cortex. We can look at this, what cue-associated craving is, meaning I saw that Krispy Kreme, I ate two of them. I was not hungry, but I ate two of them because I know they're Krispy Kremes. And it's like, oh, they're Krispy Kremes? I'm like, obviously, you can't see the sheen of the actual sugar that they put on the top and then the smell from the yeast dough rather than the cake dough. I mean, come on, really, you don't know? Like from here, laser, that is a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> and so that cue creates dopamine because I have many fond memories of a Krispy Kreme. Free donuts standing there watching donuts being made, more free donuts. Those are all like positive reinforced things, right? So as we start to look at this, craving sometimes moves out of the logical thought process. And I'll show you kind of how that happened. So we took patients and we gave them no water for three days. Nothing orally, nothing IV, to the point where when they stood up, they were dizzy because their blood pressure went down, their heart rate went up. They had moderate to severe dehydration. In that group, we put them in a functional MRI. We played sounds of water in the background, sprinkled water on their feet. We had them put water in their mouth and spit it back out. Um, we had them talk about, you know, you know, water and whatever, you know, all of that stuff. And then we looked at their brain, and we identified that in their brain, what they had was a relative size of craving about the relative size of a baseball. Pretty solid, right? Pretty decent amount of craving in there. And we did this for food, where we asked them what their favorite food was. We had them not eat for five days, nothing orally. They did get IV fluid, but no other caloric intake. And at five days, they got put in the MRI tube, and then they had to talk about that food. They would be shown pictures of that food. Um, you know, they would actually bring the food in and waft the smell of the food into the MRI machine. And then they would taste it and have to spit it back out which for two patients, they were like, you're not getting this back. Um, there were a couple that were like, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 not get paid, blah, 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 but I'm, this, this is how it's going. And so they did that, and then they functionally MRI'd their brain, and they identified that there was a relative size of craving about the size of a basketball. So 
We know what people will do when they're starving or dehydrated, right? We've seen this in areas of famine. We've seen it in times of uh, emergency where they'll break into stores. They'll steal food. They'll steal from neighbors. They'll fight over food. Um, you know, the, people will kill other people for food. I mean, think about if you walked across the desert. So if I walked across the desert for three days, had nothing to drink, and I get to the end, and there's this beautiful glass of water in front of me. It's got condensation coming down, and I go to grab it, and somebody steps in front of me and is like, no, 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 that's my water. I'd be like, okay, stab. And then I would move them out of the way, and I would take this water, and I would drink it. And people there would be like, that's legit. That guy shouldn't have done that. I mean, that was ridiculous. That guy was going to die of dehydration, and he needed that water, so that's his fault. And I think as a society, we could actually say, Eh, that could go either way. I mean, that was survival. That guy was in survival mode. You stepped in front of him. That was not a smart thing to do. So this happens at the relative size of a baseball. You know, stealing and uh, taking from other people and allowing other people to starve so you don't starve in that survival mode is a, uh, um, you know, the relative size of a basketball. So let's talk about drugs. And we looked at two. We looked at alcohol and opioids and people that had had at least two years of use. Uh, most, on the average, had five years or more of uh, use of the substances, met criteria for addiction, had been off of their uh, drug of choice for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, one year, 18 months, and two years. And we looked at all of these brains, and then people who were only 30 got rescanned at those time intervals as well. And what we found is that now, now, when we put them in the, uh, uh, the functional MRI, we weren't like, you know, sprinkling tequila on their legs or, you know, you know wafting heroin in there. It, it, was, it was a matter of all we had to do was ask a couple of questions, right? Because we knew that you'd get this preparatory bump of dopamine just thinking about it. We knew that we, we would see this. So uh, we'd showed them pictures of their drugs. We would have them talk about the first time that they used and the last time that they used. And when they did this, what we found is the signal that went off in there was about the relative size of a baseball field. So it was so far out as compared to starvation and dehydration to the point of close to death that it actually shut off about 85% of the signaling to the frontal lobe, the place in the brain where we're supposed to be making high-level decisions. The places that lit up, lateral habinula, orbital frontal cortex, value and default decision-making. At this point, it became the equivalent of a spinal reflex for them to use. And I'm pretty sure we don't put people in jail if we hit them right below the patella and their leg goes out. And that is the equivalent of the decision that is being made at this point. It is not, I am actively figuring out the pros and cons of my use and how it impacts the people around me and how it impacts my bank account or work. It is survival. And it is survival at 10 times the level. So when we start to look at what do we do for patients who have the disease of addiction a substance use disorder, or you know, a behavioral addiction such as gambling, we have to identify and realize that the person in front of us has now lost the ability for that substance to make a decision in the way that we would think. And so what we've done as a society is we've decided to inscribe in, you know, intent to this person, to think that they're making a decision to do this. I will tell you, not one of my patients woke up one morning and says, I want to be a heroin addict. Nobody says, I want my children to be taken away from me because I can't stop using. Nobody says, I want to lose my job and lose my family or die because I can't control the utilization of this drug. No one asks for this. It just is. I mean, what percentage of people at some point or another try either marijuana or alcohol in our society? Over 90%. So most people at some point have had that first time. And if you had the epigenetic setup, the genetic setup, the traumatic setup, or the whole deck of cards, then you are going to make less of a decision each time that that occurs. And as that happens, we see people that frustrate us and anger us with their behaviors. We see people that we can't, you know, how could you do that? How could you steal from your grandmother? How could you, you know, hawk a family heirloom? In their mind, they're not hawking a family heirloom they're getting something to survive. That, that whole thought process that we want to give it, that, that emotional contextual connection to that piece of jewelry or whatever it is, does not exist in that human being at that point. But I can tell you that when, when addiction is severe, 
The first thought in somebody's mind when they wake up is, please don't let me use today. Please don't let me use today. And the second most immediate thought is, how quickly can I get the substance so I don't die? Because that's, that's where it sits. And we see this over and over again in this population. Um, but yet, as a society, we have a tendency to continue to flog them with guilt and shame because of their utilization. And this happens at the highest level with our pregnant population who has a substance use disorder. You're hurting your baby. And they know this. This is not something that they are unaware of. This is a group, my clinic, I saw seven counties worth of referral patients that were all pregnant on a controlled substance. And so I've seen hundreds of uh, moms who were on a controlled substance, most with addiction, not all of them. Some were being prescribed for appropriate reasons and just, you know, we needed to figure stuff out. But they don't want to do this. This is horrifying every time they wake up in the morning. Every time that they use, it is in a state of being distraught, which actually, if we don't support them, moves into more use and more use, because now they have to cover up not only the feelings of craving, but the feelings of knowing that they're doing harm. And they're not in control of those behaviors at that point. So what do we do about this, right? So we've identified that there is a, uh, a significant change in the brain. We've identified where it is, the core aspect of it. We know that people who've had adverse childhood events um, and no res low resilience early in their life are at higher risk for it. So how is it that we move forward with getting someone stable from this disease that seems to attack every piece of our societal fabric, right? It's not just a disease of, oh, my heart's gonna fail. Um, it's a disease of, I don't have any money. I'm gonna go to jail, I have two felonies, so I can't go back, which means I can no longer earn money for my family, which means I'm gonna keep my family basically in poverty if they don't have you know, the capability to live on a single earner's income. It's gonna be, I don't have a relationship with my kids, which is gonna trickle down to those kids having abandonment issues and having the inability to attach appropriately early and then creating anger about what we're talking about with, uh, with drugs and frustration and all of these pieces. So, before I get into the how we treat addiction, I wanna talk about the piece that gets in the way of us treating addiction, and that's stigma. So stigma is an interesting concept. People throw that word around like, uh, well, I would say I threw that word around like I knew what it meant, right? They'd be like, don't be so stigmatized, you know, stigmatizing of this. But I kind of thought it was the same kind of stigma that we saw in HIV. So HIV, you guys are young, so you, you weren't around when everybody was completely freaking out. Um, about this, you know, I was a paramedic when HIV um, in the early, I was a paramedic in the early 90s uh, when HIV was kind of at its peak. We still didn't have any medication for it. We still didn't really know exactly what was going on. We didn't know how you could get it or if you couldn't. And I would show up to car accidents and be blood all over the place. And, and we're just like wading into this. And the minute we were able to identify a population that it was at a higher risk, it became an us and a them thing. But that us and a them thing was me feeling happy I'm not one of them and then having fear of them, which created the stigma. So I had a lot of fear of this disease, which we had no, we didn't understand. We had no real treatment for. Everybody was dying left and right from this in a horrible fashion. And yet, um, and we stigmatized them. But that stigma was really out of fear and a feeling of, um, thank God I'm not one of them. And so that created the stigma for HIV. And quite honestly, fear has been a lot of the reason that stigma has come you know, throughout in a lot of different pathways. I, I would hypothesize that stigma for addiction is different. Stigma for addiction is different because everybody in this room has been impacted by it. Whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, whether it's themselves, whether it's um, a neighbor, we have all at some point or another been impacted negatively by addiction. And and we may not even really know it. So when I was 12, 13, uh, the last memory of my grandfather, who was a World War II bomber pilot, hero guy, um, you know, flew over the European theater and like just like crazy stuff. Um, my last memory of him was sitting on the front steps of the VA hospital, bright orange from liver failure, um, not knowing that it was because of alcohol use disorder. I was 12. I was just like, that's a weird tan. Um, now we see it a lot on TV, seems like, especially in DC, they seem to have weird sun there. But, but with it, we identify that there is a lot of stuff happening that 
Um, well, I didn't recognize that. I just know Grandpa died, and that sucked, because I was the oldest grandson. I was the only one who really knew him. He flew me in a crop duster upside down, which I didn't know why I didn't get to fly with him after that, but apparently my mom was watching when that happened. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of these, these things that occur. My, um, one of my cousins died in the front seat of her car from a heroin overdose while her brother was sitting next to her, um, and he was too scared to take her to the emergency department uh, because he thought he was going to get arrested. Uh, this was all before I had become what I and who I am at this point. So what I had for him was hate. You let her die in that front seat. That is your fault. And I hated him for that. I hated him for that. And he died of HIV before I could understand any of this from injecting. So I wasn't close to them. I knew them as kids, and we'd kind of grown apart and these things. But the, uh, but the reality was... Even though I didn't have a traumatic environment in which I grew up in, I had great parents, you know, we never wanted for food, we had shelter all the time, I'm a white dude in America, so you add all that together, and that's a pretty low trauma environment, right? And so because of that, I, I didn't really take that on as anything but just, well, that's what they did or what, you know, what they have. And, and as we start to look at how that happened, I, real, I realized after my first two years of emergency medicine why I was such an a-hole to the patients I was treating. So I was smart, I have a bunch of degrees, I've been in school forever, I'm good as an emergency medicine doctor, I can diagnose stuff from across the room, I feel like I, I have that down, I can see it, I can do all the little monkey skill stuff like where I could put a tube in and put IVs in, blindfolded at this point. I'm good at it, I trained in inner city Philly and inner city Camden, I mean you bring me busted up stuff, I'm good. I was horrible at interacting with people because I was angry at them when they would come in and they would have some behavior addiction and I would never gave opioids. Like I was not a part of the opioid crisis development because I was like, I'm not giving you dope. That's kind of exactly how I said it too. Really trauma informed, right? You know, really fully understanding how that's, you know, that person's where they came from and who, what they're bringing to the table. But ultimately, as I got more training and started to understand this stuff and just kind of dug into the places that I knew very little about and listened to a lot of people, what I recognized is that is the worst thing that you can do to someone with an addiction is to be angry at them because they are making a decision based on survival as far as they're concerned. It is not the laundry list of pros and cons. But the way in which we have stigmatized this disease has moved past just stigma, which is I view somebody differently and have disdain for them, but I'll still give them stuff, whatever. We've actually purposefully, systematically withheld evidence-based treatment to people with addiction purely because they have addiction. We have decided as a society that we will ignore the science and we will allow them to suffer and die in droves because of the label that we have given them as addict. That is discrimination. That is not stigma. We have passed that at this point. As a society, we have been complicit in this as hospitals haven't made this standard of care, as people in the community working with parents who have these needs have not taken it in as an understanding of a chronic neurobiological disorder that needs support and not a ripping away of somebody's kids. This is, we have taken it on as a society and we've come at it from an angry, stigmatized, discriminatory approach. This is not our first rodeo with this approach to things, but I am hoping that we can start to understand that we have identified cause and effect as it pertains to addiction. We recognize that what is the risk, what is the thing that happens when it flips the switch and becomes the disease of addiction. We recognize why those behaviors happen. We recognize how we treat them. And yet we have refused because of angry stigma to do this. And I will tell you that stigma is not only from those outside of the addiction world, but also from those inside the addiction world who are themselves in recovery. Because the old version of recovery did not use a lot of the new evidence-based treatments. And there is a frustration and an anger by those in recovery the old way because it was hard. It was really hard. In fact, it was so hard that 90, about 85 to 90% of people didn't make it. And those that did wanted to give back because there was no structure, so they built systems of care for these patients. They built systems of care based on the modality that got them well. 
And that ultimately is what built out the entire system of addiction treatment in our country, which is an abstinence-based 12-step approach to the treatment of addiction. Now, everybody has their own path to recovery. And there are people that this is the right path for them. There are people that this is set up perfectly for them. It's going to help them to be who they want to be. It's going to stabilize their disease and do well. But the data is clear that when applying this modality to opioid use disorder, we find that it is less than 12% effective. Less than 12% effective when you apply it to a general population, which means it's 88% ineffective. And that is our entire system at this point, is something that is 88% effective for the crisis that we are trying to deal with now, which is the opio opioid overdose epidemic, which if you really dig into it is not just overdosing from opioids, because I will bet my last dollar that half of those are suicide, because of their suicides of despair and frustration because they never can see a way out of this disease. And for us, it just is they had too much opioid, so we just call it opioid overdose. But the reality is, is that it is a combination of a maladaptive approach to people who have the inability, because of the way the disease attacks the brain, to fend for themselves. And we have shoved them into a ruthless system that is not trauma-informed, not built based off of the data. So how do we fix this? Well, I think first it's understanding this stuff, right? It's understanding what addiction is. It's understanding how trauma affects it. It's understanding how our own beliefs and how our own thought processes interact with it in a negative way. What we do know for opioid use disorder is that if I take a person who has a severe opioid use disorder or moderate opioid use disorder, and I give them a medication like buprenorphine or methadone, it decreases their chances of death in the next one year by 60%. Do we have anything else in medicine that anybody knows of that decreases your chances of death in the next one year by 60%? What about if I shock somebody? You know, they're in VTAC, right? They come in, they're like, and I'm like, Pff. you know, we shock them, it's like ER. Well, like real ER, because that's where I do it. But, the, uh, but in the end, you shock somebody, 23% of the time, you're going to take away their chances of death. But that's only the next 30 to 60 days because their one-year mortality is higher. So really, you're only saving the life of that person for, on average, about an extra 30 to 60 days because a lot of people who have enough of an issue with their heart to go into that type of a rhythm, you can't undo a lot of the damage that was done and they end up dying. So really, that, even that is like 12%. But we get a lot of people to the hospital that way so much so that we felt that putting these uh, automatic external defibrillators on the walls of Burger King bathrooms was like a good idea. So now we know that we can possibly, we can at least increase the chances of getting somebody to the hospital and we realize this is a public health issue. So like CPR, where we trained a lot of people to do this, which has less than a 2% effect on outcome, where, but we still all do it by default, which is great because that 2% is 2%. But yeah, we shove this thing on the wall that a stranger can pull off, strap to another stranger, and shock the crap out of them in public. And that is just okay. We're cool with that. But when we start talking about naloxone, you know, the drug that reverses overdose, the anti-death serum, people freak out. We're just gonna make them use more drugs. No, that's not how it works. What it does is it takes those with the disease of addiction who have either gotten a drug that they weren't aware of or trying to um, you know, take drugs to kill themselves and undoes that to the point where we can get them to help. But what does that help look like? Anybody ever been in the emergency department when somebody comes in, status post overdose? What happens? Nurse comes up to the doctor, uh, hey doc, the patient just said they, uh, they wanna go. Really, they awake and chatting? Yeah, all right, get them out of here. That is the average ER visit. Still. So I work as a locums doc, which means I work in a bunch of different hospitals and work shifts and just come in and do it. So I get to see a lot of different hospitals, rural hospitals, urban hospitals, academic hospitals, and I just pop in and do my shift. Now, when I see patients like this, being a board-certified addiction medicine doctor, I treat them. I put them on buprenorphine, I call, get them an appointment, and we set it up, and we, we have a trajectory for them. But what I still see are people who that exact interaction happens. And these are places with names you would recognize. These are places that you would be like, thank God we're here. And we haven't gotten there yet for addiction. 
So we need to understand that the biggest thing that we can do for opioid use disorder is give people access to medication-assisted treatment, which specifically means buprenorphine and methadone. There's now Trexone, which blocks opioids. So if I block opioids as compared to adding an opioid, because people are going to be like, well, you're just replacing one drug for another. It's not true, because we don't define addiction based on the presence or absence of a drug. We define addiction based on the behaviors associated with obtaining and using the drug. So if they're taking it as prescribed, it stabilizes their dopamine, right? Because that's what we have is people with dopamine at 15, I give them buprenorphine, I give them uh, methadone, it raises the dopamine back up to normal so that they can have what? Motivation. So that they can show up to their appointment, so that they can fill out all the paperwork at foster care, so that they can get their baby back, so that they can you know, not get fired from work, so that they can keep their relationships with their family, so that they can not die, right? So this is the approach that we've taken, and the data has been around for a while. So this is not new stuff. There's not one publication, right? There are over 1,000 publications on methadone. There are over 100 publications on buprenorphine. So if you're unable to motivate and you have a low dopamine state, those are absolutely the go-to uh, drugs for you. People will always ask the, uh, uh, the question, well, well, we have this other one now, Trexone. It blocks opioids um, and nobody tries to sell it. There's no diversion. It lasts for 30 days. We give a shot. I'm like, that's great. But if they're not producing dopamine, it's not going to make them produce dopamine. It's just going to block their own endorphins from even helping them. But for some people, who make natural dopamine still, they haven't really beaten up that system, they can still get motivated, but they still have the disease of addiction, it's generally a milder form, then those people can do really well with this. But the point is, is that's neat science that we know that methadone and buprenorphine and naltrexone can help and which patients we should give it to, we know all of this. We even have a tool called Continuum, which is an online ASAM criteria tool that we can do an interview with a patient and it will spit out an answer that tells us where they should go get care. Does it need to be residential? Does it need to be in an in intensive outpatient? Does it need to be outpatient? Does it need to go to a hospital? It spits it out. And we know that if you meet that uh, number, that it increases the chances of them getting well by a huge percentage. So we have all the tools. We know the science. It's not new. Now we just have to get past the societal stigma and start moving into the realm where we normalize it and make it predictable. Predictable is the key piece because when I work in whatever emergency department I'm in, if somebody shows up with chest pain and a heart attack, no matter where I'm at, I know what to do, right? And they have a system in place to do it. If I'm in a hospital that doesn't have a cardiologist, we will fly them to another hospital with a cardiologist. And we'll get them there within 90 minutes. I mean, that is pretty crazy, right? You hit the front door, you're like, oh, it's the big one. And you do an EKG, and you're like, yeah, it's the big one. And I don't have any, a, a cardiologist here. Before they even get back to me, there's an EKG that I'm like, yeah, big one. Red button, helicopter, in, out, and they go. We've set these systems up. We have it for trauma. If you're in a car accident and you're injured to the point of needing a trauma surgeon, but you're in a rural area, that's fine. We will fly you to the place that you need to get the best level of care. It's predictable. We know what's going to happen, and you know that if you walk in anywhere in the country for chest pain, you're going to get pretty adequate, pretty adequate care, no matter where it is. If you walk in with addiction, and I'm not working, or somebody, the other seven ER doctors who are board certified in addiction medicine around the country aren't working, you don't know. You just don't know. And that's the problem, is that the place that's supposed to be the safety net is supposed to be the safety net. And it's not right now. And so in your role, what you have to do is understand this is a chronic difficult disease that impacts every aspect of life that has really no great places to get care. We have good data for care, but it's hard to identify ecosystems of care within a space. So like here in Sacramento, or if you're in Northern California in Humboldt, if you're in Southern California in Imperial, or if you're you know, in Fresno or Riverside or Inyo or Murda, you know, all of these things, um, each of these places have their own different kind of array of services that they can give or can't give. So the important piece is for you to, one, understand that this disease will impact everything that you do on a regular basis and recognize it. I don't expect you to treat it. I expect you to recognize it and make sure that you make note of it so that they can get evaluated and get the help that they need for that. Support them in the reality that they live in. That is an important piece. 
understand that the treatments that may be maligned by certain treatment providers and pathways actually have the best evidence uh, for the treatment of patients with an opioid use disorder. So as we start to, to move forward as just knowing what the default pathway is, we recognize that the worst thing that can happen is horrible trauma, followed by not being in a uh, uh, resilient, you know, being the resilient person receiving that trauma, followed by access to drugs, followed by continued utilization that meets criteria for a use disorder, followed by all of the social conundrum that come from that, which then re-perpetuates the trauma on the next generation. So, One of the other things uh, that, so at this point we've covered trauma, covered addiction, covered some treatment for addiction, we covered stigma. It's a lot of stuff, right? It's pretty dense. So now I wanna talk about one that, you know, everybody really agrees on fully um, everywhere, which is marijuana. You know, everybody's on the same page with that, right? Um, no. Uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about what that is, and I'm just gonna give you, I'm not here to give you my opinion, I'm just gonna translate the data, and then you can take that and use that however you would like. I'm neither for nor against. Full disclosure, I smoked weed in college. Whoopee. So as we do this, yeah, I could care less. Like people have the right to self-determination, but people need to know the truth about what's going on, and this is the problem what we're seeing with these billions of dollars flowing into mass communication and things like that. So let's just walk through what the science shows. One, marijuana is not one drug, it is 90 psychoactive substances in a single plant. So anytime anybody inhales marijuana, uh, they get 90 psychoactive substances. And when a, uh, somebody who sells it tells you they can tell you the percentage of those, they're just lying. They are because it takes $10,000 worth of toxicology tests to identify all of them and especially to go back and reevaluate the level. So even if we just break it down to two, THC and CBD, most people know that, right? You have tetrahydrocannabidiol and then you have cannabidiol. Um, and THC is the major component and that's the one that gets cranked up to the highest levels and that's what most people talk about as quote medical marijuana, right? They say medical marijuana, we got medical marijuana which has THCs of 27%, 32%. We even have uh, tinctures that you can put in food, we have wax which is another consolidated THC component, whatever, vaping of THC, all of this stuff exists. So the data around the utilization of THC for pain showed that it was helpful for two diseases. It was helpful for peripheral neuropathy and HIV and multiple sclerosis. At 6% THC. So there is no science to support high utilization of THC for the treatment of any pain. In fact, the studies that have looked at this have shown that it treats pain for about six weeks and then the effect goes away or the study was stopped. There are no long-term studies that show that THC has any impact on pain long-term. Even the peripheral neuropathies, which it has a short-term impact, but we've been able, unable to identify a long-term impact. And that means past 90 days. So I'm not even talking about year one, year two, year three. And people are like, well, anything if it abates their pain. And I'm like, well, why not booze? Because it works better. The studies for, for booze are better than marijuana for the treatment of pain in that time frame. But I'm pretty sure we're not prescribing bourbon, right? I need uh, two shots of Kentucky rye, you know, TID, you know. But we don't do that for marijuana either, right? They get a, a, a card that says you can use marijuana. Now, some of them say take this much tincture and take this much time, but there's no amount that they have to stop at and do it. The vast majority of it is a wide open thing to use as required for your ailment. But the data is clear that even for pain, it doesn't work that well. People say, well, what about glaucoma? In order for you to actually treat glaucoma as effectively as any of the eye drops that occur, you have to smoke five to six times a day in order to maintain that intraocular pressure. And people are like, that's why I smoke five or six times a day. <laughs> Swear. Yeah, it's just not. I mean, we have to have the, the real conversation. What we also have is the other conversation about um, what happens in the adolescent brain. Well, we have good data now to show that if adolescents start to smoke marijuana early, which there are a lot of them that do, it, it knocks about 10 points off of their IQ. Um, and that seems to be permanent. 
and not, not regressive. And there are two studies that were redone after this huge European cohort data that we looked at, and then they re went back and reanalyzed and reevaluated for cause and effect, and they found that maybe it's not 10, maybe it's eight. You've made somebody dumber. <laughs> eight, 10, it's dumber. It decreased your ability to take on new information, compartmentalizes and spit it out in a synthesized way. That's what IQ is. You know what else IQ is? Income. Every 10, every 10 points over 100 is about an extra 40 grand per year on average. So not only has it taken away their ability to maybe compartmentalize some stuff, but it also has taken away their ability to be financially stable as a population. Because everybody's gonna be like, I had this roommate, he smoked weed all the time, he was still super smart. He would have been smarter. <laughs> I'm like, maybe he had some IQ to burn, but most people don't. Right, average IQ is 100, go a little below that, it's rough. Right, things get tough, math is hard. So when we start to look at these things, every little bit really does count. It also, for the data, very clearly shows that it does not help anxiety past a couple of weeks. At that point, it actually worsens anxiety over time, and the anxiety and panic you feel when you stop is withdrawal. It's no different than nicotine, because nicotine has the anxiety withdrawal that comes with it. So when they're like, I smoke weed for my panic attacks, you mean you smoke weeds to cause panic attacks? Because that's an accurate statement. So alcohol will also stop panic attacks for a couple of weeks, but again, we're not writing that prescription. You know, even if it's like, well, one Cosmo twice a week, you know, whatever. We have to just understand it is dangerous for some, neutral for others, and maybe helpful for a small percentage of people, but a pragmatic conversation needs to happen because it is not a positive thing for a large population to smoke a bunch of weed when they're 12. This is a reality that we're seeing, and right now what we see is a decrease in the sense of harm caused by marijuana and youth, and because of that, there's a significant increase in the utilization. Now, we've seen an increase in the thought of harmfulness of tobacco, so we've seen a decrease until recently, when we've put out vaping, go jewel, right? So when we start to really think about these pieces, if addiction is a substance getting into the brain of somebody at risk, the people that are at the highest risk of this are youth, because think about the number of times anyone in here without trauma, without anything, had really crappy weeks, right? Middle school, high school, who here didn't feel lonely or sad or frustrated, you know? So with marijuana, it has the same addictive potential in adolescence as alcohol, 17%. So 17% of those that use it consistently will meet for a marijuana use disorder. The interesting thing is we've known this for a while because marijuana has been the number one cause of admission for adolescent treatment for addiction for the last decade. So it's not like we had no idea. Even when it wasn't, quote, legal, it, you know, it still caused it. Now, if somebody wants to smoke some weed on a Saturday, I don't really care. But what they need to understand is that it's still affecting them on Monday. So when people say, well, booze is worse, I'm like, you gotta qualify that statement. Because if you take a shot of booze on a Friday night and you take one, you have a really nice, I say bourbon again, obviously someone in here likes bourbon, but the, uh, if you take bourbon and you put it on some ice and I drink one or two on a Friday night, I'm impaired for about four hours um, in a clinically identifiable way. Next day, no hint. Now, if I got rip-roaring drunk, then yeah, you can, you can see changes that happen the next day, but generally they're cleared 24 hours after that. However, if you smoke one dube on Saturday, Monday, you're more likely to crash a plane. Literally, they've evaluated what we call standard daily memory. So the memory when you get in your car and you know where your key goes, and you know how to put your seatbelt on, and you know where your turn signals are, all those things that are just like muscle memory, you don't have to think about it, or like where all the buttons on an Xbox controller are. Um, they, and this is one of the ways that they measured it as well, is they took people who were gamers and they measured their reactivity based on um, these fine motor skill pieces, and an Xbox controller is one of those that requires fine motor skill capability. But they also did it for pilots, and what they identified is that up to 72 hours out, the majority of people were still impaired. So let's say you're in a safety sensitive uh, profession and you only smoke it every now and then, 
and you smoke it on Saturday, you go out and you smoke with your friends, it's probably gonna be cleared by Monday, to be honest. If you don't smoke that much and it's not trapped in your fat tissues, it doesn't stay in the system that long. But at the end, you're still impaired by this because of the way that it changed the brain. It's a problem. So people will say it's more dangerous, you know, I would rather somebody smoke weed than take opioids, right? Well, it depends. If I've just had my femur shattered in a car accident and I'm in the emergency department, you better not walk up to me with a freaking bong. You better have a syringe full of Dilaudid and that better be making my pain better because that's gonna hurt, right? And then now we know it doesn't work for pain afterwards except for a short amount of time. But at the same time, opioids are good in that situation. Are chronic opioids good? No, we know this. Palliative care, hospice, that subset of the population, I don't care if you smoke a whole marijuana farm. It doesn't matter to me, right? And that's not the conversation we're having, but people want to create these straw man arguments where they'll say something like, well, weed's better than a bullet. <laughs> well, <laughs> weed still does the things I said it did. That didn't really knock down my argument. You just created some other smoke and mirrors argument. That's called a straw man argument. So think about those when you hear people retort. If you say there are studies that show uh, that marijuana decreases, you know, your, your IQ, and it seems to be on repeat studies that it's permanent. And watch their reaction, especially those that are pro, because I'm not pro or con, I'm just giving you data. This is just stuff that's in randomized controlled, long-term studies. And there is no government conspiracy. Government is not that organized, guys. <laughs> Honestly, if I've worked in DC, there is not a collaborative group of people who got together to somehow figure out how to conspire. They're just doing their jobs nine to five and going home. Right, so let's be realistic about what is happening. In, what was it, 2003, there was a Northern California Growers Association that put together a business plan. And the business plan was is that they wanted to go to the states who could put it on the ballot, and they would put it on the ballot for uh, medical purposes, and then it would become so ubiquitously utilized and uncontrolled based on the policies that they built, that at that point it would just be one more step to make it legal, right? Well, that worked. Right? It worked because what happened is, is that if you look at all the diseases that they put on there, you could sign up for medically. There's no data for any of those, by the way. You know, they're just, they were just put there by lawmakers. There are no references. If you look at the legal stuff, there are no references to medical literature for why they put that there as one of the reasons that someone could get certified for it. Except for the glaucoma, which we talked about, and except for the pain, which we talked about. Everything else, it was an opinion. So in the states that legalized it for medical use, who wrote the legislation? Wasn't the lawmakers who got the, the you know, the, uh, the rough draft, right? Ultimately, this was built by industry. Now, this happens in a lot of other places, so it doesn't make them any less culpable as compared to other places like opioids and things like that, but I'm just explaining. Th this is all just where it is. So just, if anybody asks you about smoking weed, don't get stuck in this, well, it's better than blank. Right? It might be, but it's still an addictive substance that causes significant harm in all of the outcomes of addiction. But instead of causing mortality, like opioids, it causes morbidity, which means a decrease in motivation, which means a decrease in, an increase in anxiety, an increase in depression, a decrease in your IQ. Those are all not compatible with successful lives. Right? Well, I want to take something natural. Right? You hear this one all the time? This is the most manipulated plant on the planet. More than GMO corn, more than GMO rice. It, its natural state is 3% THC. That is its natural state. And if you look at it when we've pulled it out and we've identified what's in it, it is full of all the pesticides and all the same stuff that everything else is. So, I mean, just these are just the reality. So as you look at it, you can make your own choices, but make them based on the data. Make them knowing that some people are gonna be at risk for this, and it seems to be as addictive as alcohol for adolescents, less so as people matriculate into adulthood above about the age of 25, but it's still 12%, so that means 12% of the people who use it on a regular basis are gonna become addicted to it, and that addiction means that you're gonna choose it over you know, friendship, you're gonna choose it over work, you're gonna choose it over all of the other things that we talked about. Polysubstance was another one that we talked about. Everybody's polysubstance. Period. 
I've treated thousands of patients. They have one drug that you know, pushes dopamine more than the others, and when it's available, they will generally use it, but I have never had anyone come in to see me for care, and I've asked many of my colleagues where they only use heroin, where there's nothing else in their system, right? No, or they only use marijuana. Not, not usually, it's not the case. They usually marijuana and um, alcohol, or they take a benzodiazepine, or they, uh, um, or if they're using heroin, they use a <coughs> commonly a benzodiazepine, which could be like a Xanax or a Valium or those things, um, or also smoke marijuana or do that. And if I take away their drug of choice, sometimes they just increase the utilization of the other drugs because the addictive behavior is still in place. So we always have to come all the way back to just what are the behaviors associated with the substance that we worry about with addiction? And when we worry about it with addiction, why? Because it's destructive not only to themselves, but everybody around them, right? So th those were the, the major things that we wanted to touch on today. And so now what I wanna do is take questions, and with those questions, when you ask them, I will deep dive the answer as far as we need to. Anybody ever in here ever watch Tosh.0? Right, super funny, but he would always take a joke to the point where everybody was just done, like he had grossed everybody out. My job is to do that, but not gross you out, but just get to the point where you're looking at me like, I don't care, bro. That is too much science. I wanna get to that point where everybody's internal need for data has been answered. So that can be about um, whatever. It could be about trauma, it could be about stigma, it could be about neuroscience, it could be about substances, any one of them, and go. And I'll repeat it. You can just say it to the crowd and then I'll repeat it. Yeah, great question. So how is the response to the opioid epidemic as compared to the response to the crack epidemic? Well, uh, we spent about $500 million on the quote crack epidemic. It was mostly state funded and we've already spent close to $11 billion um, on the opioid epidemic and most of that money has gone to build systems of care. Why is that? So, which is the follow-up question that you would ask? Well, it's because white people died for the opioid epidemic. And so because white people's kids died, who happened to be in Congress, we actually passed legislation that started to fund a system of addiction treatment. But because that the crack epidemic lived in the inner city where it was basically urbanized and mainly African-American, it was a their problem. And so that's again, just true. I mean, I don't, people can whiten it up all they want, but that's just a reality of, of what it was. And, and now that white people are dying in the middle and upper class, all of a sudden it's now, well, this is a crisis. I mean, this is, like, this is really bad, like an epidemic. No, I mean, so we have the CDC pushing grants, we got HRSA, we got CMS, we got SAMHSA, we got states with commissions and governors, opioid councils and blah, blah, blah. But let's be honest, the reason that the, it's different is because of who it's affecting. It's a great question. Yeah, no, no, no. No, let, so let me, let me unpack that a little bit. So first off, we have the government can't coordinate as a conspiracy against, or is not currently coordinating as a conspiracy against any specific race. I can say that because I've been there. However, I know that it's been done. And sometimes it's actually been done without them thinking it was being done. You know, so there were things like the crime bill that were thought to be helpful. And in fact, the people that sat in the deliberations, and I went back and actually, this is how big of a nerd I am. Uh, I went back and watched um, recordings of the conversations they were having during the Clinton administration when I could have cared less about politics, you know, back then, and, uh, and, and watched what they said. And they honestly thought that the crime bill was gonna get the criminals out of these urbanized neighborhoods um, so that people who wanted to live in peace could live in peace and prosperity and get better. So they really thought that. However, what we found was the unintended consequence of um, if it looks like, if it smells like, if it is, then you're going to jail. And what we found is this massively disproportionate incarceration of a single race in the, in the US. And when that occurred, we created trauma, 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 trauma. Um, back in the, well, really up to n yesterday, at, uh, well, today now, um, we have still uh, not figured out the educational system and the way in which it should integrate uh, cultural competency as well as a piece of this because somehow we have created a situation in education where, and this is a part of the addiction piece, we've created the system of education around it needs to look like what Caucasian education should look like. And, and, and we do the same with the Native American population, American Indian population, and I've, I've spent time working in that population as well. Um, 
We do it in the uh, immigrant Asian population. We do it in that. This is, this is education. Not recognizing that being culturally sensitive is not really being culturally appropriate. So just because I know that you have this culture, but yet you got to come and do mine, um, that's not the same. And so from a cultural standpoint, we still are holding people back from being the true full self in a sense of we're not allowing communities to create the edu educational systems um, or the treatment systems that will provide the best care for that specific culture. Because there are tenets of addiction treatment that need to be applied, but there are also tenets of the culture that if you don't use those, the chances of somebody getting well are slim to none. There is, however, a lot of bad decisions because they're not including those people who are affected by those decisions. That still occurs, it actually occurs less. And so while that may seem like just one kind of racist thing after another, it's actually just still coming from the right place doing the wrong thing. There's a point at which, who gives a crap? The outcome's still bad. There's a point at which we just gotta, we can't give that as an excuse, right? But there are changes being made where it's a requirement that any new project that's funded from the federal government include those that the project will impact on the planning team. There are a lot of those pieces of elements that are being there. What we still haven't figured out how to do is fully empower a community to own itself. And I think that that's where a lot of the treatment for um, highly urbanized centers as well as highly rural and remote centers, um, because I'll tell you, you know, my brother lives in South Texas, uh, right next to the Louisiana border, and that is a different world. It's a world I'm uncomfortable in. It's a world where vocabulary is not something that I feel comfortable with. The way that they talk about other people and people that aren't like them makes me very uncomfortable and sad in many ways. Um, but they need a treatment system that kind of fits who they are as well. And, and so until we figure out what are the tenets of delivery of the system that we pay for, not necessarily the little kind of accoutrement, the little pieces of it that we wrap around it that are more culturally sensitive, it will always feel like the system is against you. And I think that's the big leap that has to be made is while we develop these systems of care for addiction treatment, that we, one, don't just develop an opioid treatment system, we actually develop an addiction treatment system, and we do it in a way that it empowers the, the cultures that are hit in the locations in which they're being hit. And I think that's what would go a long way to feeling that way, because I do find people, colleagues will come up to me that I work with that look like me, um, and some will say things that are overtly racist and they're freaked out when I point back, and I'm like, I can't believe you just said that, it's ridiculous. I don't even get away from me. you know. Or I try to educate them depending on where it comes from, but most of them are pulling our hair out just trying to figure out what to do. Like, where is the place that I should own now? It's a really uncomfortable space to be if you haven't dug into it. Because what people know now, we're in a, a re-equilibrating portion of our country right now. And this, this, this is really, addiction has laid bare every crack in healthcare. And, and as we open it up and we start to look at it, one of the biggest cracks in healthcare is the ethical and uh, culturally appropriate approach to healthcare. And so as we try to do this, everybody's trying to figure out where they live. What is the right path to step? What is not? What is the 40 years of what I learned? And what do I have to unlearn? Because it's just ridiculous and bad. And, and a lot of that is, is coming from a place of, I just don't know what to do because we can't have these conversations very often. They're complex and uncomfortable for a lot of people, which is a bummer because they're not that hard to have. It's just being in a space of listening, but at the same time, that has to feel like an overarching somebody still pushing down. And we're finally at the point, and I'm telling you, we're at the point where people are just like, just what do I do? And so I think we're at another inflection point in our society, um, especially with how divided we have become, that even amongst people that look like me, we have divided. I mean, we, we're, it feels almost like what I read in the history books around the 60s, interestingly. Um, but I think we can do a, an, a better than adequate job of coming out of this on the right side of history this time, and not just creating some artificial means of separation and change and equality, but actually doing it right. Because I think if we don't do that, then it's always gonna feel like the minority group in a country is gonna be treated like the minority group and not like a true independent voice of their own healthcare and their own lives and their own consistency. And then it's always just gonna feel like somebody's conspiring against you know, whatever group that is. Sorry, bit of a diatribe, but 
Um, but I think that that comes into this. This is a really rare opportunity in addiction that if we set this system up right, it can create some equality in these neighborhoods that have never really felt that equality. They can get the same level of care as someone who, in fact, if we do it right, the people that are on Medicaid will get better evidence-based care than the people with a lot of money who keep going out to Malibu and, and, and not getting well, right? I mean, this is the reality, is the system that's set up for the super rich people is actually not evidence-based very much at all and is not good. And so if we do this right, then it's kind of turning the tables on. We're building a system that's actually better for those that have less and less supports and one that is more sustainable long-term than I'm gonna go somewhere for 30 days and somehow magic happens and I come back home and everything's better. Because if you can't get well in your community, you can't get well. And so we have to create a, a feeling of wellness in these communities based on where people live so that they can uh, you know, move forward with that. It's a great question. Yeah, so the question is what steps are we taking right now to kind of undo this? And I, I will tell you from the perspective of someone delivering lots of kind of consulting and grant-based help in the state right now, Every single uh, group that has money coming down from the uh, STR and SOR grant, which are the mechanisms by which the government has given billions of dollars to help build this system out, all of us make sure that the people at the table uh, match the people that we need to be appropriately helping. We make sure that they have equivalent voices. Um, we, don't, we don't ever go into a neighborhood or into a county and say, we're here to help. I walk into a county and say, my job is to give you the information that I hold. I've spent a lot of time getting it. I'm gonna give that to you freely. How you use that is up to you. And that's the approach that actually almost all of us have taken. In fact, I, I don't, and when I say almost, it's just because I don't know what a couple of people are doing, but everyone that I've seen are being really sensitive to that reality right now. Um, and I, I know from, from us, we have fully manipulated our process based on that input. We've had completely different looking systems that have those core pieces that we've been building in counties uh, that have people that feel like they haven't been heard. And that's both dense urban and rural and especially tribal populations that we've been working with uh, where we're trying to build a system that looks like their system of getting well. And we wanna do that culturally. So, and we're having this conversation a lot. Um, this conversation amongst those of us doing this work is a pretty easy conversation to have now. We call each other when we feel like things aren't right, when something was said, when something was done, when somebody wasn't heard. And we do it in a way that's uh, congenial and appropriate. Um, and it's more just like a course correction than, than a beat down. And I think those are things that have been really, really helpful in the system that we build will be inclusive for all of those that need care. And by the end, when we're finally done, there should be a system of care that fits the cultural comfort zone of whoever needs to get that care that they can find, that they don't have to like get in like a C-130 and flown to another place. But that's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. So CBD, uh, cannabidiol, one of the, the second most common um, psychoactive chemical inside of marijuana. So the interesting thing is first is that as you increase THC, the plant can only produce one or the other at a certain amount. So as you increase THC, CBD goes down and vice versa. If you, if you modify the plant to make more CBD, then it's low THC. <clears throat> the research on CBD is really promising. Um, most of the early studies have now just been done on animals and there are only a couple of studies on humans, but every single one of those have had positive results. So I think that CBD has a really good potential to do a great job for some of those. It is not snake oil, right? And the problem is, is because it is now ubiquitously utilized, it will never become a pharmaceutical. Because if people can buy it on Amazon, uh, then nobody's gonna spend the half a billion dollars it takes to have one that's dose appropriate, do, you know, consistent appropriate and tested and developed. So unfortunately, um, the success of CBD is the undoing of CBD. And we will most likely never identify it as a true means for healthcare because it became so ubiquitously available so early and nobody spends a half a billion dollars to monetize something that you can get for basically nothing on Amazon. So we've seen this with N-acetylcysteine um, or mucamist, which is a drug that has been shown in adolescence to decrease marijuana use by 60% consistently um, because it's a GNC health product and you can buy three months of it on Amazon, it's not controlled, so nobody's gonna spend money to package that so that we can deliver it in a way that is prescribed and monitored and evaluated long-term. So I think it has a lot of potential. I think all that potential is gonna stall in the lab because people can just use it. 
Um, so unless we actually wrap our heads around it and clamp down on it, then, so this is the only way that we can actually make a therapeutic modality a part of mainstream medical normal care is by actually taking away some of the utilize it, utilization of it in other places so that we can consolidate the way in which it's done based on the scientific method, meaning we've separated groups randomly, we've identified what happens if we have this and we have this and we have this, which one came out to be more effective. Not, I had a friend who took it and she said it was awesome. Because unfortunately, that's the way a lot of the science around this has been done. Uh, but, but the heavy science that's been done, the real stuff that's been done is good, but we still don't know dosing. I have no idea what it does at two years. I don't know if it permanently changes the brain for the negative and you can't go back and you gotta take it forever. I don't, I don't know any, we don't know any of these things because the literature doesn't exist. But uh, yeah, no, it has promise, but I think unfortunately, the minute it's in like a, like a, a, a soda, then it's, it's done. It's doomed for uh, snake oil relegation for the, rest of its, uh, for the rest of its life. Yeah, so this is a good stump the chump pathway. I actually do have an answer for that. So um, interestingly, the company that makes the EpiPen just uh, came with profits lower than what was projected because there's a generic form that's coming out at a cheaper uh, rate. And so they're probably gonna have to lower their price secondary to the competition. But the price of a drug will be what the market can bear. That's, that's just the way that our world works. In a non-governmental over, you know, governmental controlled healthcare system, uh, drugs will be as expensive as people can pay. And it's a life-saving drug, so people tend to pay more just so that they have access to that life-saving drug. And because of that, um, they're gonna keep it up there at some level. We're gonna hit a new price point, but it's never gonna be super cheap unless the government says, we're just gonna make EpiPens widely available in a cheap way, uh, which would actually go against what the government role in healthcare has been in the United States ever. Um, so the chances of that happening, even in a Medicare for all situation, still not gonna uh, do that. And unless there's legislation to put profit margins or cost you know, equivalent you know, increases that they can put on that, um, it's gonna be difficult to get that down. Yeah, Narcan is now pretty ubiquitously available and it's mostly the nasal stuff. And that's just been dumped into the system. In fact, it, we're almost to the point where we can finally just kind of put it on buckets out on the street and just have people pull it. I mean, my seven-year-old has one in his backpack and knows how to use it, by the way, and the nine-year-old. And um, in fact, they tested it on me. Um, and, and I will tell you, even if you're not taking opioids, if you use it, it makes you feel not great for a second because we have our own endorphins. And I'm 47, which means I have chronic pain. Um, and, and so because of that, my endorphins kick up because I don't take anything for it. And, and you know, I do yoga and mindfulness, like the stuff that we all talk about. But the, uh, and with that, it generally helps it, but my endorphins are cranked up and it actually blocks a portion of my endorphins. So when I took it, I actually went into a little bit of withdrawal, which is interesting. So, uh, um, so if, if you're gonna teach your kids how to do it, just maybe you know, practice on a dummy or something. Um, well, I guess they did practice on a dummy, but the, um, it worked out, yep. Yeah, so the question is, is you know, the difference between genetics and epigenetics, are, is there one that's identified as more important uh, than the other? So genetics would be the most important one because ultimately, you can be born with a receptor that just jumps on whatever substance that is. I mean, you can have a GABA receptor, a gamma aminobutyric acid receptor that binds to alcohol and it's like the perfect fit. Um, the same thing for opioids, which is why you'll have some people who take an opioid and they get nauseous and they feel terrible because their receptors just aren't really built for it. You give them a different opioid and they're like, yeah, that's the one. Um, and it's because uh, the receptors are different. So we do have people that have um, receptors that are more sensitive to certain substances, making it more pleasurable out of the gates. Um, the best way to think about it is genetics is your light switch and uh, epigenetics is your dimmer switch. So that's just, you get an on off with your genetics and then you can modify the intensity based on epigenetics. It's a great question. So the question you know, is you know, how do you have a good conversation about trauma? If you're gonna deliver trauma-informed care, how do you deliver education to parents about trauma without being offensive? Um, and the answer is you normalize it, very much through the same motivational interviewing pathway that you would lose, use for other things. And you say, um, what we have found is that there are a lot of kids in school, meaning not just their kid, but that there are a lot of kids in school um, who have had some traumatic events. And those traumatic events can vary. And those, those varied traumatic events can be they saw one of their friends killed, they, uh, you know, had, they were assaulted, they've had a parent die, they've had a parent arrested, um, they've had parents assault them, some have been sexually, so you just walk through the things that we define trauma with. Um, in a very just matter of fact, this is it. 
So because we have identified that if those have occurred, it can create lifelong changes that we can't necessarily undo very easily unless we start early. And by building resilience and identifying those in those traumatic environments, we set them up for success later because it won't impact their ability to be educated, to be successful, and to, do, you know, to move on in life where they need to. But we also realize that you as parents have had to live with those same things. And if you feel like that you need help with that or you know someone who does, um, we're happy to help connect that. But it's never, that's the best way, just data science and math. Just a very nondescript, this is, this is, we know this, this is the reality. Um, it is what it is. And I think the more that we can have that conversation in a pragmatic, open manner, the more likely we are to actually have some resolutions to those things. Because when I've had those conversations with my patients or my patients' families, I've had moms and dads come to my office of the patients we're treating in our clinic just like beside themselves, knowing that they had created a traumatic environment for their kid and feeling horrible about it. And especially when we started talking about why somebody may be violent, why some of these tendencies kind of come out, why some of these uh, I hide or I'm anxious or I'm panicky, you know, occur. And, um, and you know, domestic violence, the, some of the, the most like meaningful interactions I've had with patients have been males who are delivering domestic violence to someone. Um, and instead of um, just maligning them and being frustrated by what it is, you actually dig in and you find out that they lived the vast majority. In fact, I don't have an example of one in my clinic that didn't have this. Um, a lot of just a mountain of early life trauma. And even ongoing trauma in neighborhoods, especially if uh, depending on which uh, neighborhood or, or what culture is uh, predominant in that neighborhood, it's ongoing trauma on, on a regular basis. There's ongoing violence, there's ongoing killing, there's ongoing fights, there's ongoing fear. Like I can't sit on my front porch because I'm gonna get shot is like ongoing violence. And so, um, so those are, those, that's the way that we do it. Just a matter of fact, this is trauma. We try to bring to this uh, trauma-informed care, and instead of saying, why are you doing this? You know, what happened to you? You know, that, that very open, tell me about, you know, how we got to where we are. Tell me about your day. Tell me about your week. Tell me about you. Build that trust. Help them to understand what a, um, you know, what a true authentic healing relationship is. I mean, that's, that's the piece because that's the thing that moves you into resilience because you have the capacity to translate fear and frustration and anger into friendship and into attachment that's appropriate. Take one more and then I think we'll need to be done. Yeah. Yep. So the question is, is do we, are there any studies on if mom is using while pregnant, does, uh, does that impart an increased risk? So what we have found is that whether mom is using during pregnancy um, is equivalent to whether or not she had a substance use disorder in the past or not as well. So even if, if she had a substance use disorder and stopped using while pregnant, um, the risk, the genetic risk is still the same and the epigenetic risk is still the same. So using during pregnancy does not impart any new risk of addiction. It does impart risk, if they have active use, it imparts risk of low birth weight, um, uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of stuff, death, you know, all of these things. Now, being on medication-assisted treatment like buprenorphine or methadone is the standard of care. And if we do that, and I think this is an important piece to, to make, and the baby is born and has withdrawal upon uh, birth, the baby's not born addicted. We hear this all the time. And I will tell you, if, if I hear anybody say that, I, I'll punch you in the throat. Because I, I literally am just over this at this point. Because addiction is a behavioral disorder that is identified by the way someone seeks out and uses a drug. And I am pretty sure newborns aren't trolling the street looking for heroin. Right, drag a little baggie behind them, like, you know, a little pamper full of poo. It's just not happening. So they, they have a physical dependence, and they will go through physical withdrawal, and we treat that. And then at that point, there are no untoward outcomes that we can identify. And in fact, if we sent them home and did not treat the, the opioid withdrawal, their mortality just on pure opioid withdrawal, if they don't have a metabolic disorder, is zero. So, so we're finding that we can decrease their hospital stay from 17 days to four, if mom is on medication-assisted treatment and everybody just understands that it's just withdrawal, right? And if mom's in treatment, then baby is in treatment, ultimately, because when she's breastfeeding, she's actually giving a nice delayed, you know, decrease in the total dose of medication, and the baby weans off of it uh, wonderfully. And I will tell you, there is no better feeling than getting a mom who's at risk of losing her kid, having that kid delivered, and having them go home together as a family, as compared to pulling these people apart um, at birth 
and creating all kinds of trauma on top of trauma and taking away that baby's ability to ever have adequate attachment. Now, there are times you have to do that and it sucks, but most of the time when it's done, it doesn't have to happen. What we need to do is support our Child Protective Services colleagues with good education and with good support systems and have a predictable treatment pathway for these moms. We do have one of our grants that we're working with Stanford and we're building that across the state of California right now. And that's my favorite grant because, I mean, making families is cool. That's pretty fun. But the, um, the biggest piece is the support system has to be continued because all it takes is that one, you're hurting your baby moment in an office, in a, an interaction and a thing, and then the mindset is off to the races, the guilt, the shame, and then relapse is right after this. So it's really important that people understand that mom getting into treatment is the best thing that can happen. And you don't have to be off of medication. You need to be on the thing that decreases your chance of death by 60%, which is medication-assisted treatment for opioids. And it doesn't have to occur inpatient either. It can, but you can just put them in intensive outpatient, give them support systems and peer support, and they do really, really well. And so... Um, the biggest harm to baby is an unstable mom who has a risk of death and never did get treatment because then that kid gets pulled, gets put into foster care, and the data for foster care is not great, especially for long-term attachment, long-term um, emotional disabilities down the road. Um, but when they stay with mom under the same circumstances, even if mom's not perfect yet, which to ask perfection of someone in a disease with all of these things is really weird because we don't even ask perfection in hypertension, diabetes, asthma control. We don't ask for that. And if somebody with diabetes walked over and ate Krispy Kremes like I did, we don't kick them out of a practice or take their kid. So we just need to start seeing this as a chronic uh, disorder and actually treating it no different than another chronic disorder, identifying danger where it is, but then also making sure that we're not creating intent to danger that doesn't exist. And if we do that and we use just the data science and math to make our decisions, adding on the cultural competency and appropriate um, emotional connection to the people that we're working with, aka empathy, then we're going to go a long way to building a system that is sustainable and humanizing rather than dehumanizing. So thanks. Thank